to love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Six feet. Well, good evening, and welcome to St. Michael Lutheran and to the Spirited Life on this beautiful Saturday. It's great to have you in worship here tonight, uh, those who've joined us in person and the many who are worshiping at home via live stream. We certainly look forward to a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our time in the Lord's presence. A couple announcements as we make our beginning. First of all, a reminder, especially for those worshiping with us at home, that we will be celebrating Holy Communion during this service, so please have your elements ready to go for that part of the service. Also, we are very blessed this weekend to have with us uh, Reverend Paul Anderson, who will be sharing the word of the Lord, and those that, of us that have been a part of the St. Michael family for a lot of years uh, are very familiar with him. He'll be sharing the word of the Lord with us, uh, the message God has put on his heart, as well as his uh, musical abilities as well. And we also welcome uh, partner in ministry, Dave, uh, who is with us as well. And uh, uh, Paul and Dave led the elders in the prayer team in a wonderful workshop this afternoon. So we appreciate their presence among us here this weekend. Also, not that we haven't gotten used to it, we certainly have, the construction that's been going on in different areas of the building over the last couple months. And as you walked in, those worshiping with us here in person, you'll notice in the lobby there's some carpet uh, torn up, there's some furniture from the office that's been moved out, and we're going to another phase uh, in our work. Uh, over the next two weeks, we'll have a sewer line that runs under the lobby, under the church office, that's going to be repaired. So uh, we just ask for your patience for any minor inconveniences that might cause uh, as you walk through that area as you're in the building. Uh, probably most importantly is to note that for the next two weeks, the church office will be closed because of that uh, construction. Now, going forward from this point on anyway, the office will be closed on Fridays. That has nothing to do with the construction. The office will be closed on Fridays going forward. But for the Monday through Thursday, uh, when it normally would be open, the office will be closed Monday through Thursday, the week of the 12th and the week of the 19th. However, Karen and Diana will be manning the phones remotely from home, so you can still call the office the next two weeks, Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5, with any requests or needs that you might have. So just uh, make note of that. Also, uh, just as we continue in the pandemic and the latest news and so forth and what's taking place in Michigan, just a reminder, uh, again, we're so thankful that we can continue to worship in person and we will be. But we will also continue to try to practice the social distancing protocols, which makes it possible and safe for us to do that. So as a reminder, when you're seated here for worship, to try to practice the social distancing, uh, we ask members as they enter the building and leave the building uh, to wear their masks. And at this service, we do have a mask-only, mask-required section, which is the north part of the balcony. So uh, just a reminder, and uh, things will continue to work well and we will get through this. The Lord has indeed got it. So with that, let's check out our opening theme video. We are like clay, static, unrecognizable, nothing. A formless mass with no direction, no purpose, no meaning. We are like clay, pliable, movable, moldable. In the hands of the Creator, we can be changed, made beautiful, given life. Nothing becomes something extraordinary. The transformation takes time. The process is tedious difficult, painstaking. But soon, we see the beginnings of something wonderful. The formless takes shape. The unrecognizable finds its identity. The meaningless is given purpose. From nothing comes beauty. We are like clay, 
each piece different than the next, given unlimited potential in the hands of the potter. And speaking of being in the hands of the potter, a reminder that we will be having a healing service tonight following this service, so it'll be approximately 6.30 or 5 to 10 minutes or so after the conclusion of this service. So again, all are invited to be a part of that, and again, Pastor Paul will be leading us through. With that, I invite you now to please rise for a time of confession as we make our beginning tonight in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, you have given your Son to die for us, and you have forgiven us all of our sins. Just open our hearts tonight what you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts to go before our Lord in a time of silent confession. Most merciful God, I confess that I'm in bondage to sin, and I cannot free myself. I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I have done, and by what I have left undone. I've not loved you with my whole heart. I've not loved my neighbor as myself. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship our Lord with our opening hymn, Because He Lives. Life is worth 
the living just because he lived. And then one day, I'll cross that river, I'll fight my I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he Because he lives, what a, a stirring way to start our service. Uh, because he lives, there's so many things that really trigger in our spiritual walk, not the least of which is the opportunity we have to pray to our Lord and Savior. Join me now as we pray. Lord, your children gather this evening. Lord, and those among us, those at home, Lord, we have many prayers to raise up to you. Lord, for those who are suffering times of illness, Lord, we pray for them. Lord, for those who have relationship issues, and Lord, we know there are many of those. Lord, we pray for understanding, a willingness to reach out, mend these relationships. Lord, that's what you want in our lives. Lord, if we have economic woes for jobs or uncertainty. Lord, be with those people. Give them comfort. Lord, we also intercede for our nation and our world, our community. Lord, there are many who are ill. Lord, we just, uh, just stand in need of your healing touch. And Lord, we have individuals from our congregation who have asked that they be lifted up in prayer today. We pray for Charlotte, Charlotte Van Halla, Judy Knowles, and Jamie Glotz. Lord, we also stand in mourning with the family of Leonora McFarlane as as she has passed into the church triumphant. Lord, be with her family. Comfort them. Lord, let them feel your presence. Lord, in each and everything and the intercessory prayers that we have offered in our own hearts and minds this evening, we lift these up to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let's see, i a little behind here. Uh, we'll turn this over to Paul for some special music. Be seated.
Thank you, Paul and Sue. Our first reading for this evening is found in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning with the third verse. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine powers to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Our gospel for this evening is found in John, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Please rise as you are able. John 8, beginning with the 31st verse. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, Yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your Father. The very words of our Lord. Please be seated. Oh, excuse me. I'm a little early. Please remain standing, and let's join together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like you to meet my wife, so I'm going to call her and hope she's there and have her pray for you. And I'm going to talk to you kids. Stay right where you are, kids. We're going to be talking to you as well. Hi, you've reached Karen Anderson. She said she'd be there. I'm going to try one more time. Call mom. She's mom because we've got six kids and we've got a lot. I don't know how many grandkids we've got, a lot of them. I think we've got 16 so far, but they keep coming. So we'll probably end at about 20 or so. 20. Here she is. Karen, I'm looking out at some wonderful people here. And uh, also, I'm doing a children's sermon, so I want you to help me do the children's sermon, okay, honey? Do you know that I thought it is uh, only five to five right now? Well, we get we get an hour faster. We're ahead of you by an hour. Yeah, it's. It, I didn't even see the phone. I wasn't looking at the phone. <laughs> okay, well, say hello to St. Michael here, honey. Wow, my goodness, they must be very holy. 
Uh, I don't know. Are you? <laughs> they like that. Yeah, St. Michael. So you pray for them, and then I'm going to talk to the kids. Pray for uh, the people here. Yes. And yet you also live in our hearts. It's hard for us to even imagine. But this is the truth. Your word tells us that, and we believe it, and we thank you. And we ask that you would allow us to open everyone's hearts now to receive more. More of the Holy Spirit. More yes. of everything. Yes. Name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Honey, I've come back here. I don't know how many times I've been here, but I've been here many times. And I don't know if it's because they like me or they're going to give me one more chance. And I'm not <laughs> sure which that is. But I, I'm going to take my chance now. I'm going to talk to the kids. So thank you, honey. I love you. I'll see you when I get home. Well, love you too. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you for putting up with that. So, kids. I've got six kids, and here's how we had them. Boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. And uh, especially Erica was afraid of these big barkers. Those doggies really made her afraid. But when she would run to Daddy, I'd put her up on my shoulder, and then she'd look at the dogs and say, Hi, doggy. She was in a safe place. And we need to find a safe place. I never told my parents, but when I would run to bed as a child, I'd get at the end of the room, and then I'd run across, and I'd jump because I thought maybe some, I see somebody shaking their heads. Yeah, you did it too, huh? Okay. I figured something might be under the bed, and I didn't want to get grabbed on my way, so I jumped. I don't do that as an adult. I got over it by the time I was probably 21 and uh, didn't do it anymore. It's good to find comfort in the care and love of a father, of our father and mother and our father in heaven. And I want to talk to you today about strongholds and how to break them in our lives. What is a stronghold? Well, David talked about strongholds, and when he talked about it, it was always positive. He said, God is my rock, God is my defender, God is my stronghold. Well, that was a positive. It was a safe place, a place where David could run. He said, in my distress, in Psalm 18, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to him and reached his ears. In the New Testament, the word stronghold is only used one time, and it's negative. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Listen to where the strongholds are. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So strongholds come into our mind when we believe lies and don't know the truth. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. We're being deceived. And so how does that happen? It's when we believe lies. So I was meeting in Montana with a group of young adults. I, I was at a conference where I was speaking to the adults, and then they said, would you mind speaking to the young adults? Why well, I love young adults. 
So I said, sure. So we sat on the floor. There were about 20 of us. And I talked about how to break strongholds in our mind. And then I said, what props up a stronghold are lies that we believe. And so I reached out and I tapped the girl who was sitting just in front of me. And I said, what lie or lies have you believed? Here's what she said. That I'm not beautiful enough to get married. Wow, that was being pretty vulnerable. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry that you have believed that lie. It's not true. But I'm sad for you that you believed that. And then I reached over to a young man. We had guys and gals. And I said, what lie have you believed? Now, if he had said, well, that I'm not handsome enough, I wouldn't have believed him. Because, guys, you tell a guy that he's not good looking and whew, it's no big deal. You tell a girl that she's not beautiful. I see women shaking their heads. It's a different matter, right, ladies? That's, that's going below the belt. And he said what I thought he would say. He said, the lie that I have believed is that I don't have what it takes. That takes a man out. If you, tell, if, if you tell a man, you don't have what it takes. And he's in a place of weakness, and he believes that lie and continues to. That'll do damage to his heart. Dave and I were in a meeting in my house. There were five guys who were leaders, who were pastors and were leaders. One was apostolic leader in, the, in uh, the Central America. And I told him about strongholds. And I said, Either you have some or you have had some. I said, what have you believed? And we went around the circle. And here's what this apostolic leader said. I've heard that voice from the time I was a kid. You don't have what it takes. And it's been very hard for me to overcome that. So I want to talk to you about how you can deal with any strongholds in your mind that you have been led to to believe, and let me just share with you a few lies I've heard people share. God is angry with me for what I did as a child. Anybody felt that one? I'll bet some of you have. Most people have three times the talent I have. God has abandoned me. The only thing now is to run. I'm not appreciated much. I'm being neglected. God isn't hearing your prayers. He doesn't speak to you like he speaks to others. If you just tried a little bit more, you'd be more worthy of God's grace. You don't fit in anywhere. Why try? When we embrace lies, whose territory are we in? Who is a liar and the father of lies? So he he invents lies, and he wants to take us down And if he can take us down, if he can cause us to believe those lies, he's got us in his camp. And so we need to be especially careful. There are two pictures that are important for you in understanding the truth and not believing lies. Your picture of God and your picture of yourself. So Satan is going to tamper with your picture of God. Andrew Murray said, your picture of God is the most important thing about you. So if I were to ask you, what is your God like? What would you say? You know, if we asked Eve what she would have said, well, he kind of withholds, I, he, he holds back, because listen to what, when the serpent asked Eve, did God really say that you can't eat of the fruit? And she said, well, we can eat of all the other trees, but we can't eat the tree of the Garden of Eden, we can't even touch it, or we'll die. Satan knew he had her there, because she was adding to what God had said. 
And Satan said, you will surely not die, for you're going to be like God. And gave him, her a picture of God who was a little insecure, manipulative, controlling. And she went for it. And she ate the fruit. And how devastating that was. She believed a lie about God. How devastating that she believed that lie. You remember the story of Jesus and this master who sends out three servants. One he gives five talents, one he gives two, and then he, one he gives one. And he says, go to it. One comes back, and he says, you gave me five, and I've gotten five more. What does the master say? Way to go. You've been faithful in a little. I want to give you much. Enter into the joy of your master. The guy with two said the same thing. What did the guy with one say? I knew you were a hard man. Where did you get that? Where did that come from? Here's the sad thing. Perception is reality. What you perceive is what you get. If you see God as hard, that's what you receive. The prodigal son. What do you think about his father? You're stingy. And that's what he received. He didn't get what the father wanted to give him. All, all I've got is yours. But he couldn't lay hold of it because he had this outlook that his father wasn't a good father. And so he didn't get Our picture, perception, is reality. I wonder what happened to Zechariah. He got, he got a visit from an angel, an archangel. And the archangel had this wonderful news that they've been waiting for and praying for for decades. Your wife Elizabeth's going to have a child. And he should have said, oh, this is so wonderful. I'm so thankful. Oh, I'm so glad. What did he say? Uh, how can I be sure? I'm old. And he said, my wife literally has many days. He didn't want to say she's an old lady, but he said he, she has many days behind her. I think he was wounded, and I think they changed his picture of God, and God wasn't quite as kind as he thought he was, and it wounded him, and he spent nine months' time out for that, and he was disciplined because he wasn't ready to receive this wonderful news. It had changed somehow his picture of God. And when trials come to your life, what do they do to your picture of God? When difficulties, I hope it doesn't change how you view God. I said there are two pictures. Your picture of God. Who's the other picture that's very important for you to have? Picture of yourself. I want to show you a... Uh, picture that you may have seen, and we're just going to see about three or four minutes of it. Could you turn that on, please? <laughs> Creepy little monkey. Will you stop following me? <laughs> who are you? The question is, who are you? Who are you? Important question. I I who is God? Who are no, you? I'm not so sure. Well, I know who you are. Shh, come here. It's a secret. Uh, enough already. What is that supposed to mean, anyway? It means you're a baboon. And I'm not. <laughs> I think you're a little confused. Wrong. I'm not the one who's confused. You don't even know who you are. Oh, and I suppose you know. Sure do. You're Mufasa's boy. Bye. Hey, wait! You knew my father? Correction, I know your father. I hate to tell you this, but he died a long time ago. Nope, wrong again. <laughs> He's alive, and I'll show him to you. You follow old Rafiki, he knows the way. Come on. You hear what he said? You don't know who you are. <laughs> 
Don't go up. Hurry up! Oh, wait, wait. Come on. Come on! Would you slow down? That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No! Please, don't leave me. Remember. Father! Remember. Don't leave me. Remember. What was that? <laughs> the weather. <laughs> Very peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can't hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? First, I'm gonna take your stick. No, 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 no! Not your stick! Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back! Get out of here! <laughs> clapping a great lesson two pictures your picture of God your picture of yourself he forgot who he was and he was eating grubs in the jungle lions don't eat grubs and he had to come back face scar picture of the enemy picture of Satan and then take his rightful place I cried when I saw this and I'll tell you why I'm wearing a t-shirt before I ever heard the words from Simba I heard from my own father many times. He never said, be back at 11 o'clock. But he always said, remember who you are. So when he died, my mom died, we had a, a uh, retreat, and we all came together, and we said, what did Dad mean? We need to know who God is, and we need to know who we are and walk into our, our destiny. And that's what Simba, when I saw that, I just cried because I had heard those words, remember who you are, every time I'd go out for my own father. And I hope you hear them so that you can walk into your destiny. You need to know who God is and know him as loving, caring, forgiving, kind, powerful. And you need to know who you, you are and walk into your God-appointed destiny. That's the second picture. 
and we see how some people did and some didn't. John, in Genesis 37, Joseph's brothers were victims. The father shouldn't have loved Joseph more. That was wrong. But they took it out on Joseph. That's, that's like a five-year-old. If I have a problem with you, I hit you. That's what they did to Joseph. And so they expected Joseph to do the same thing to them. After the father died, they invented this lie that dad said you're supposed to be kind to us and forgive us. What did Joseph do when he heard that? He cried. He wasn't going to get back at him. He said, am I in the place of God? In other words, I'm not going to get even with you. I forgive you. You meant it for evil, but God meant it good. He wasn't victimized. A lot of people are victimized by their suffering and their sorrow, and then they misappropriate the picture that God has given them. He knew who he was, and he walked into his destiny. The children of Israel, they were given miracle after miracle. The biggest one was the, the sea parting, and they walked through on dry ground. What did they do when they ran out of water? First thing they did was complain. They were victims. They weren't victors. They didn't know who they were. They were walking through the wilderness and complaining about all their problems, and they never made it. They never fulfilled what God had called them to do. It's very sad. And people who are victimized by their problems, rather than like Joseph, victors over them, they won't walk into their God-appointed destiny. So what are what, what is exactly a stronghold? Let me tell you what it is. It's something that I run to instead of God. It's a lie that I continue to believe. It's something I don't like talking about. It's a secret, and sometimes I don't even know the secret. It's a part of my identity. I wrote this booklet because of a friend who had a serious stronghold, and she couldn't get over it. It took her years, and so I wrote this because I wanted to help people who had struggles like hers. What are some examples of stronghold? Perfectionism. If I just do everything just right, I'll be okay. I've, I will have earned my points. Anger. People make me upset. I have a right to get mad. Self-pity. No one understands me. No one appreciates me. I'm all by myself work. I am valuable because I'm a hard worker. People need to appreciate me. Lust. I need a high right now, a moment of harmless pleasure. And then we have lies in our mind that prop up these strongholds, and they're in our mind, and they're keeping us from walking into our God-appointed destiny. God wants to free us, and Paul says, we take every thought captive. So we come against the lies that are in our life that we've chosen to believe, and we break the power of these strongholds in our lives. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. I'm going to tell you three stories, and we're going to pray together. I'll tell you about Jerry. Jerry was in graduate school. It was hard work for Jerry, but he was doing well, and he was promised a job when he finished graduate school, and he was looking forward to this job. He really anticipated it was going to be well-paying. It was going to fit who he was. One night, he felt a little stress, and so he had a glass of wine uh, late at night, and <sighs> it relieved him, and so he was able to relax. That was good for him. A week later, that same pressure came back, and so he had a glass of wine, and nothing wrong with that. It, was, it helped him. The pressures got great in the spring, and so he began having a glass of wine in the morning. 
That helped him. Then he began having a glass at morning and at night and sometimes in between. He had to drop out of school because he became an alcoholic. He had a, a mental battle and he couldn't overcome it. And that stronghold, which was a friend at first, turned on him and it became a prison to keep him from doing what he was called to do. Verna, she had a good husband. He called one night and said, hey, I, we can't have our date like we would planned on. I can't be home. I got to work late. She sort of understood, but she called Nancy and just said, oh, he's not coming home tonight. And her friend Nancy said, well, that's the way men are. And he was a good husband. But a month later, the same thing happened. Well, she was getting a closer relationship with Nancy, so she called her up again, and she said it happened again. And so they commiserated. Can you hear that word? Miser they shared their misery together. Marv didn't know what was going on. Six months later, they separated because a stronghold in her mind that kept her from believing the truth about God about her husband. One more. This guy was an elder of a church. And one late one night, he tried a little porn. And he was embarrassed, but he was also fascinated and he couldn't get that out of his mind. I mean, it really gave him pleasure. And so he decided to try it again. And he had that same left. Of course he was shamed. Of course he wasn't going to tell anybody. But after a month, he was hooked. And he was unable. It was a stronghold that was in his mind that he couldn't get rid of. So I want to go through some steps here. And as I do this, what I'd like you to do is think, are there areas in my life where I am in bondage in my mind to certain thought patterns that have taken hold of me and kept me from walking in the freedom that God wants me to have. So we start with the first thing I do is I identify. I identify the stronghold. So you're asking yourself, is there an area that I have where I've let the enemy in? where I have propped it up with lies. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what we need. So we have to see where the lies are and come against them, identify the stronghold. Second, I confess my attachment. I say, God, I'm sorry. I've allowed this stronghold to come at me. It's affected my habits, it's affected my mentality, it's affected my outlook, taken away my joy. I, I confess my attachment. Then I renounce the lies. I've got to see the lies and say, I, I renounce these lies. I come against these lies. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we need God's light to shine on our life, not to condemn us, but to bring us into a place of freedom in his light. So I renounce those lies. And then I, I forgive others. Often when we hold on to strongholds, there are people that have hurt us and that we need to forgive them. And so I extend forgiveness to any who have hurt me. And then number five, I affirm the truth of who I am in God. I affirm the truth of who God is. God cares about me. God loves me. God's got a plan for me. God wants me to walk into my identity. I affirm who I am. I'm destined to walk in the presence of God and to walk and see his work done in my life. So I want you to stand as I pray with you. Let's stand together. Believing that God is a God who, who deals with these strongholds in our life and brings us to a place of freedom. Could you so open your hands like this, like you're 
like you're in a place of receptivity. Father, you're shining your light down on us, not to condemn us. You're shining your light down on us because you have something you want to give to us, because you're kind, you're loving, you're forgiving. Thank you. Thank you that you're showing us those areas where we need to make changes, where we need to see your work in our minds, and we need to come to a new place of freedom. Thank you that you are able to do that. We, we are sorry where we have gone astray in our thinking. And in Jesus' name, I come against the strongholds that have held on to people. I come against those strongholds in Jesus' name, and I say, break strongholds of darkness. Break lies of the enemy. Break. Jesus, come and bring your freedom to your people. Bring your freedom to your people, that they know the truth, and that the truth can set them free. Free to love you, free to love others, free to serve, free to go low. Thank you for what you are doing, even now, to break people from the power of darkness. Thank you, God. And if you need prayer afterwards, we're going to pray for healing. We'll pray for other, if there are needs that you have related to what I've talked about, you stick around, we can pray for you as well. We'd love to. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Pastor Paul, for sharing the word of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. After he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I now invite uh, those at home to take and eat that bread and that cracker. Those who are in the sanctuary, take that wafer. Take and eat. All who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are welcome to partake in Holy Communion. The body of Christ for you. In the same way also, he took the cup. After he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And do this also in remembrance of me. So please, take and drink the blood of Christ, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve us in the one true faith to life everlasting. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with his favor and grant us his perfect peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, two announcements at this time. Uh, two announcements at this time. Uh, two announcements, a reminder, uh, first of all, that uh, following uh, the closing hymn, to please be seated and wait for the ushers to please dismiss you so we maintain social distancing. And then also, following this service, within a few minutes, again, we will have our healing service, and again, all are welcome to uh, join us for that time and experience God's healing and his restorative touch. So with that, let's conclude our worship with the singing of Our God Reigns.
I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. My love, worldly pleasures are all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me. I surrender. I'm Dave Denzer, lead pastor here at St. Michael Lutheran Church. I want to thank you for being part of our worship experience today. It means a lot to us. I hope that you were touched by God's Spirit and that your heart was open to Jesus and His love for you. If you'd like to know more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, I invite you to contact the church office and just ask to speak with a pastor. You know, we've got all kinds of things here for really every member of the family. Just check things out on the church website or on the church Facebook page. Well, I hope God blesses your week this week, and uh, until next week, we'll, we'll see you in church.